This video is brought to you by Fabulous. What's up everybody, Michael here, and today I'm gonna complain about taxi rides. I've always thought New York is a place where it's easy to get a taxi, but it's not. Taxis were not driving by, um, so I you know, went on the apps, I was looking at Lyft and Uber, and things were 15 minutes away, and it cost, I'm not exaggerating, like $50 to get a couple miles, and it sucked. And I wondered, what's the point of having all of these apps if they don't do anything, right? This is not the Uber that I used to know, nor, the one that inspired hundreds of businesses billing themselves as Uber for laundry, Uber for restaurants, Uber for toilets. These companies, of course, make up the gig economy and they use slick, intuitive apps to organize contract workers who can make all your dreams come true for cheap. Yet those promises have become more suspect as consumers face longer wait times and higher costs for services. This all has us wondering, was the gig economy a farce built on an unsustainable financial model? Why are some of the most successful gig startups struggling? How has it become such a dominant force in American labor even as its flagship companies continue to tank? Well, let's find out in this wisecrack edition on the gig economy. What went wrong? But before we get into it, I wanna tell you about this video sponsor, Fabulous, the number one self-care app to help build better habits and achieve your goals. If you find it tough to stick to new routines or if you're hoping to improve your day-to-day -day happiness, Fabulous is here to help. It's a digital coach that uses behavioral science to help you create new habits and stick to them. Fabulous creates a personalized daily routine that can help you get on track to achieve goals of any size, whether it's to increase your productivity, decrease stress, or even a thing that's important to me, drink more water. The app helps you create rituals throughout the day starting from the moment you wake up. These small steps help you ease into new habits and can lead to long lasting changes. You can choose between two programs on Fabulous, habit tracking or dedicated programs. With the habit tracking approach, you can go at your own pace as you complete bite-sized tasks and get gentle encouragement throughout the day. You can pick from 100 tasks within the app or add your own. With the dedicated programs, you're immersed in a multi-week journey of guided self-discovery. Fabulous will send you inspiring and motivational letters, and at the end of each one, you'll choose a positive action for that week. These new positive actions are added to your daily routine, and the app sends friendly reminders to help you stick to them. And with a Fabulous Premium account, you can track an unlimited number of habits and access all the programs and exercises the app has to offer, like coaching sessions and support circles. So join the community of more than 30 million users around the world and start building your ideal daily routine. The first 100 people who click on the link in the description will get 25% off their fabulous subscription. And now, back to the show. Now, my little rideshare anecdote, as you know, is becoming the norm. As Derek Thompson's recent piece in The Atlantic put it, something beyond rising energy and labor costs is leading to sticker shock on once cheap urban amenities. Clearly, something has changed since Airbnb first hit the scene in 2008. This was the perfect moment for the gig economy to make its grand debut as the US was reeling from the Great Recession. The unemployment rate had doubled and other workers faced furloughs and reduced hours. This made alternatives to classic employment seem quite appealing, like a potential safety net. As economist Juliet Shore writes in After the Gig, in the years following 2008, People came to believe that digital technology could solve the problem of work. The thinking went that algorithms and crowdsourcing could do the work of bosses, while software could reorganize economic activity into a person-to-person -person structure. In this way, she notes that this empowers individuals to take control of their lives. Vast swaths of the economy, especially in service, are ripe for this transformation. This vision came to be called the sharing economy. Note that we're gonna focus on the United States and we're going by scholar Luigi Zingale's definition of the gig economy as anytime you have a digital platform that coordinates a large amount of people doing a job. It's the case of Uber, it's the case of Lyft, it's the case of Airbnb, it's the case of Fiverr, it's the case of the Mechanical Turks on Amazon. And this model changed the very idea of what labor could be. It seemed to offer freedom and flexibility without compromising wages via the magic of part-time or gig-based work. 
For folks without spare rooms to rent out, Uber launched in 2009, followed by Fiverr in 2010, Rover in 2011, Instacart in 2012, and beyond. There was a gig for seemingly every skill set. Whether your specialty was picking the ripest avocado, bagging the sh of a stranger's dog, or copy editing somebody's novel. Plus, you could hypothetically make your own hours and be your own boss with your earning potential limited only by your willingness to work hard. This caught on fast. By 2016, the Pew Research Center found that nearly 25% of American adults were making money from gig apps. And the startup founders behind the apps preached the gospel of Silicon Valley utopianism, promising staggering innovation. Like Uber's grand plans for self-driving cars or Amazon delivering your year's supply of floss by drone, it would be a brand new economy. At first, it seemed to be working. That is, if you didn't follow the money. If you're paying $7 for that ride, how is your Uber driver making a living wage? Well, A, they probably weren't, and B, the baffling bankroll was thanks to venture capitalists who allowed gig economy apps to operate at a loss. This was based on the assumption that in the future, when they've cornered the market on, say, self-driving cars, that's when they'll really see a profit. In the meantime, people got used to the idea of $7 rides. As Thompson writes, for the past decade, people like me, youngish, urbanish, professionalish, got a sweetheart deal from Uber, the Uber for X clones that vaguely pretended to be tech companies. Almost each time you or I ordered a pizza or hailed a taxi, the company behind that app lost money. In effect, these startups backed by venture capital were paying us, the consumers, to buy their products. But are those glory days over if consumers are no longer getting too good to be true prices? Because the gig economy has always run on underpaid labor. And to understand this, we need to contextualize where gig work as we know it came from. As scholar Lewis Hyman explains, the decades following the New Deal witnessed the golden age of stable, long-term employment when union membership was skyrocketing and companies competing for top talent started offering things like generous wages and employer-based health care. But after the economic boom in the 1950s, corporate structures started to change. At the top, short-term consultants started replacing executives, while at the bottom, union workers were replaced by cheaper day laborers. And while these moves helped businesses seem lean and therefore more profitable, this also decreased job security. This, as Hyman argues, was indicative of a sea change in how corporations function. They went from primarily trying to minimize risk to primarily trying to maximize profits. It wasn't about keeping your family company running and making quality goods for decades. It was about making bank today. And this was a whole new way of looking at business. The risk-taking entrepreneur thus became the capitalist ideal. And in pursuit of standalone, unabashed profits, short-term returns became the new goal. And one way to make sure your quarterly ROI looks shiny and efficient is to hire flexible laborers who take up less of your operating costs overall. The tech industry of the 70s and 80s relied on this business model. Short-term investments partnered with flexible production to great growth and success. It also, as Hyman points out, relied upon the use of undocumented labor at an industrial scale by the way of subcontractors who were paid on a per project basis. The rise of the internet would greatly influence how work is sourced and conducted, making it even easier to source temp workers via Craigslist or apps, no agency necessary. These workers would be known as independent contractors. There are big benefits to digitally sourcing contractors as Jamie Woodcock and Mark Graham explain in their book, The Gig Economy. For one, it adds a layer of invisibility and isolation that obscures the people doing the work. It's hard to know how many colleagues you have at TaskRabbit, after all, if there is no way to communicate with them. And for many of these apps, the sheer number of willing contractors has created an oversupply of labor. Woodcock and Graham write, as a result of this oversupply, individual workers have very little power to negotiate wages or working conditions, which is why workers way back when started forming unions to begin with. But unionizing is virtually impossible for today's gig workers, because to form a union, you have to be an employee. And people who work for Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, Airbnb, and so on, are not actually employees. This may sound like a technicality, but it's essential to the way these companies function. 
Unsurprisingly, when faced with a 2020 California ballot initiative, Prop 22, which would exempt companies like Uber from a state law that would have required these companies to treat workers like formal employees, DoorDash, Lyft, Uber, Instacart, and Postmates spent $204 million on a publicity campaign supporting it. See, if somebody is your employee, you're obligated to provide things like overtime, bargaining rights, and healthcare. According to the Seattle Times, classifying your workforce as independent contractors instead can save companies 30% or more on labor costs. And for companies that were definitely not all making a profit, this would have made their tenuous situations even more slippery. In the end, nearly 60% of voters agreed that all the bells and whistles of formal employment were unnecessary especially if it jacked up prices on services they had come to rely on. The sheer amount of money poured into this campaign made Prop 22 the most expensive ballot initiative in US history, and arguably, it paid off. Except, uh, except not for workers, though. Definitely didn't pay off for them. In this way, we can see the gig economy as being emblematic of a bigger shift in the power of labor. As sociologist Alexandria Ravenel concluded, for all its app-enabled modernity, the gig economy resembles the early industrial age. The sharing economy is truly a movement forward to the past. That is, a past before workers had all the protections they gained through striking and organizing since the 19th century and through the protections of the New Deal. Now, those prospects are unattractive to the door dashers earning an average of $1.45 an hour for their labor, not counting tips, according to Seattle-based advocacy group PayUp. But it is hugely attractive to businesses and investors. After all, when you classify workers as contractors, you take a lot less liability. Laws governing actual employment require companies to implement worker and consumer safety protections. Under the gig economy, all that risk is transferred onto the workers themselves. Themselves. All this while many gig workers aren't seeing the flexibility to income ratio they were promised. They're urged on by apps that penalize workers who don't work enough, like with TaskRabbit's 75% recommended acceptance rate, which impacts the number of jobs available to workers as well as their rate. As Sherry Murphy, a Bay Area-based rideshare driver, explains, working for Lyft provided only so-called flexibility and that her fellow drivers, many of whom also happen to be people of color, were working 70 hours a week and still living at or below the poverty line. As Murphy said, over the years, I found myself in a deadly and inflexible cycle and trapped in working just to afford to keep working. Ultimately, these gig workers were trapped in a big race to the bottom, plagued by unreliable pay, alienating working conditions, and a profound lack of institutional support from the mega corporations they work for but are not employed by. But despite our gripes with Uber and Co's business models, we still haven't answered the question. Why are they struggling? We think it's pretty simple, and it goes deeper than the pandemic messed with the economy. But from the start, these apps have been indicative of an economic logic that is fundamentally flawed. And that's because it's based on speculation about future profitability. It's a house built on a foundation of sand, which was conveniently delivered by a task rabbit. Gig startups have mixed material goods and services carried out by real human beings with algorithm-based apps, which work on a logic of inhuman efficiency. Just as the 2008 financial collapse revealed that the real estate investment market was built upon shaky investments and repackaged high-risk loans, the snowballing collapse of the Uber for brushing your teeth industry shows that the future of profitability that everyone imagined, from founders to investors to workers to consumers, was exactly that, always rife with internal contradiction. But these companies were able to speculate so wildly because they had billions of dollars of backing from venture capitalists. It still saved an enormous amount of loss by treating its employees like interchangeable contractors rather than actually investing in a stable workforce. What's more, when businesses like Uber openly and proudly declare that they're here specifically to disrupt an industry, those disruptions can be seismic. Many traditional jobs like taxi drivers or hotel concierges have been decimated, if not essentially eradicated in a short span of time. Most tragically, this has resulted in a spike in suicide amongst New York City taxi drivers, who after investing huge sums of money to get their medallions and huge amounts of time and training, saw their livelihoods destroyed. 
Meanwhile, restaurants adapting to delivery apps have seen as much as 33% commission off of order total. So rather than revolutionizing the modern economy, these apps have actually left it in worse shape than they found it. And that affects all of us. As Hyman writes, when our corporations fail, it hurts us all. Yet when they succeed, we do not get compensated for our risks. American corporations, as it is often said, socialize risk and privatize return. And the architects of these apps appear to be getting off as easily as bankers did after the 2008 financial collapse. At the same time, for millions of workers, protections that took decades of agitation by labor unions to be realized have been stripped away. This whole era calls to mind something else that happened in the mid 20th century, the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which burst in Kool-Aid man style to temper union practices. Most crucially, with the introduction of right to work laws, which still exist. In short, right to work laws prohibit mandatory joining of unions for both private and public sector jobs, arguably undermining hard won solidarity. As former union buster Martin J. Leavitt wrote in 1993, Taft Hartley meant the bosses could once again wage their war with near impunity. And at this point, about 14% of US workers had already participated in post-war strikes, so bosses were particularly invested in shutting that shit down. The passing of Taft Hartley effectively defanged organized labor's power, preventing unions from putting certain kinds of pressures on employers. And the mainstreaming of contractor status in the gig economy could be seen as yet another attempt to systematically roll back worker protections and further stymie organized labor. And it's one that, if it continues to be successful, could have implications on your work life, regardless of if you've ever done gig labor. Because this model seems ripe to expand, even as the companies that pioneered it are struggling. A recent Mercer study shows that 60% of C-suite executives anticipate they will substantially replace full-time employees with contract workers within the next three years. That is to say, gig labor may be coming for a lot of us. That would leave many more folks doing what Woodcock and Graham call precarious work, i.e. work that comes with uncertainty as to the duration of employment, a lack of access to social protection and benefits usually associated with employment, low pay, and substantial legal and practical obstacles to joining a trade union and bargaining collectively. Workers doing this labor make up what some call the precariat class. But as scholar Kathleen Thielen points out, precarity is not the same as poverty and it does not only hit low-skilled workers. It also affects highly skilled groups, including professionals such as airline pilots and lawyers who are also employed increasingly on flexible contracts. And hell, there's even a trend toward hiring CEOs on short-term bases to help companies deal with sudden departures or navigate scandals. It seems that truly no one is safe from the oncoming shift into the wild world of gig labor. From companies hiring two part-time employees instead of one full-timer, to outsourcing HR work to contractors or apps, we're increasingly being taught to expect less and less from our employers. And they're increasingly aware of what they can get away with. As former CEO of GigiWalk, Bob Baramapur put it, you can hire 10,000 people for 10 to 15 minutes, when they're done, those 10,000 people just melt away. So are we all fated for a Frosty the Snowman style demise? Because despite all his criticisms, Hyman still believes in some of the early promises of the gig economy. He just thinks this version of it was deliberately constructed to only benefit those at the top. But for regular folks who are still craving the freedom of gig work, is there a way to make it actually work for everyone? The way Hyman sees it, maybe. He argues that the idea of decentralization that underpins the gig or sharing economy could usher us into what he calls a post-corporate capitalism. Worker-owned co-ops could create a more dominant peer-to-peer -peer economy where apps are owned collectively so as to allow workers to control the fruits of their own labor. Or as economist David Corton put it, post-corporate capitalism opens up the possibility for us to treat money as the facilitator not the purpose of our economic lives. And we're already starting to see examples of this new approach in real life. The Co-op Ride app, for instance, is the largest worker-owned cooperative in America, and its members earn up to 10% more than when driving for Uber or Lyft. After all, if the gig economy has weakened traditional corporations and opened up our perceptions of what jobs can be, what could that mean for our relationship to work? Is there any way we can get a 
do-over on the promise of the gig economy? Hyman writes, technology creates new possibilities, but only we determine our future, or at least we have every time before in human history. The wage connected to a job might just be a passing moment in our economic past, a footnote to history. Some thinkers have envisioned a gig economy based on what they call portable benefits. That is a system where the healthcare and paid leave and other things afforded to employees could follow you from task rabbiting Ikea furniture to bagging a frat house's booze supply for Drizzly. But will this starry-eyed vision ever manifest? All signs are currently pointing to probably not. But at least according to some theorists, there is still potential to use these technologies to fundamentally rethink what labor looks like in the first place. So what we're saying is, weirder things have happened. But what do you all think? Can the gig economy be transformed, or are we all just going to get apt to death? Let us know in the comments. Thanks as always to our patrons for your support, and don't forget to check out all of our updated Patreon perks. And check out our Wisecrack live stream right here, Thursdays at 11 a.m. Pacific. Remember to like this video, subscribe, and hell, maybe even ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.